Now, about Oswald framing Batman. You know when the poodle took Batman's batarang earlier? Well, he goes into the dressing room of the Ice Princess, the woman who lit the tree at the beginning, posing as a talent scout. Say cheese. <laughs> cheese. Over at Wayne Manor, Bruce and Selina discuss their personal life, with Bruce mentioning his previous relationship with Vicki Vale from the first movie, and how he had to leave her because he felt what he told her would frighten her. It shows that Bruce has trouble balancing his life as both Bruce Wayne and Batman. Selina seems understanding and gets right to making out. Well, she's feisty like a cat. Must be a coincidence, though. Though they both stop when they accidentally touch each other's scars they inflicted on each other. Just in time, too, because news gets out that Batman... Kidnapped the Ice Princess? I thought Penguin murdered her off-screen. Either way, both Bruce and Selina have their own excuses to leave the manor. As well as their own costume change montage. I like how he has multiples of each suit part. With that, Batman arrives near the tree lighting ceremony and locks down the Batmobile. Only for the baddies to unlock it because, again, they somehow had blueprints to it. And they begin hotwiring it for their little plan. Batman goes to save the Ice Princess, only to be intercepted by Catwoman. Eat floor. Uh! High fiber. Hey, stud. I thought we had something together. Can this relationship be saved? She takes the princess up to the roof of the building, where she is left standing on the ledge. She could just carefully step down, but... Long dark! Quick wings, do your thing! It's a Christmas miracle that she pushed the button on the way down. So now Batman is framed for murder. The police shoot him before Commissioner Gordon, played again by Pat Hingle, can stop them. Fortunately, his body armor protects him as he only slides off the side of the building and onto a balcony, right where Catwoman is waiting for him. Mistletoe can be deadly if you eat it. Mm, but a kiss can be even deadlier if you mean it. Not just the overt violence of this movie, but... Damn, it's awfully hot in here! She then taunts him for how every woman he saves ends up dead or resentful. He escapes and uses his cape as a patented bat glider to return to the Batmobile, unaware that it's been tampered with. And I gotta say, the shot of Batman flying over a bat-infested Gotham Plaza is pretty cool. Turns out, Catwoman thought the Penguin only wanted to scare the Ice Princess and not murder her. He then offers her a glass of champagne to celebrate a job well done, as well as a wedding ring. Thankfully, Catwoman outright refuses his proposal, saying that she finds him disgusting, which leads Penguin to hook one of his flying umbrellas to the back of her neck and sends her off into the sky. Bye, my unintended. Go to heaven. But only dogs go to heaven. Oh well, she drops down into a greenhouse and survives. The Penguin then uses a quarter-slot Batmobile ride to operate Batman's Batmobile, causing it to drive wildly through the streets and crash into anything in its way. Maybe this is a bad time to mention this, but my license is expired! As Batman tries to regain control, he slips in a disc to record the things Oswald is saying to him. Just relax, I'll take care of the squealing... Wretched pinhead puppets of Gotham! Finally locating the control device, he punches a hole in the floor of the Batmobile and rips it off. Just in time to break hard in front of a helpless old lady the Penguin wanted to run over. Now to show off one of the new Batmobile features for the McDonald's Happy Meal toy! <laughs> These toys got recalled due to how dark this movie is. Well, at least Oswald can begin his mayoral rally to disgrace the mayor and Batman. While that's happening, Bruce goes into the Batcave to hijack the radio waves and use the recording he got to expose him for who he truly is. I'll take care of the squealing, wretched, pinhead puppets of Gotham. <laughs> you gotta admit, I played this stinking city like a harp from hell. <laughs>
With the truth revealed and even Max Shrek abandoning him, Penguin loses the trust of the people of Gotham as they rightfully begin pelting him with vegetables. Is there always someone who brings eggs and tomatoes to a speech? Way to make an exit. He retreats back to the abandoned Gotham Zoo, where he denounces his humanity and decides to enact the plan he's been building the whole time. The list of names he was writing down was of all the firstborn sons of Gotham City, just like him. And his plan is to kidnap them while their parents attend a masquerade ball hosted by Max Shrek that night, taking them into the sewers and drown them all. Holy shit! Isn't that a little, uh... Well, at least someone has the good sense to... It's a lot! I'm quite scared right now. Meanwhile, Alfred informs Bruce about Shrek's masquerade ball. He's initially disinterested, but thinks maybe Selina will be there. When he gets there, I think they're playing Super Freak by Rick James in the background. Shrek gets some words in about how untouchable he is before Bruce runs into Selina. With how they talk, it feels very apparent that they know who they actually are. Either that or they're just that good at hiding it. You take off our costumes. I guess I'm tired of wearing masks. Me too. She states her intentions to kill Shrek, pulling out a small handgun, though isn't quite sure of what she should be doing as Bruce tries to talk her down. She then looks up and notices they're standing under the mistletoe. Mistletoe can be deadly if you eat it. I guess it can be even deadly. And there's the moment where they finally seem to realize who the other is. Of course, before this can be resolved, the penguin decides to crash the party by blowing a hole in the floor and rising up with his duck boat. He tells everyone his plan, and I can't help but laugh at his little pet penguins with helmets. That's both funny and adorable. Anyway, he's kidnapping Chip, since he's Max's firstborn son, but Shrek offers himself instead, since he did betray him essentially, so I guess Max does have a heart after all even if it's only for his son. Once in the sewer, Penguin gloats about how he's going to murder the children by luring them with an umbrella done up like a baby's crib mobile and dumping them in Max's own toxic sewage before he joins them. And wow, this is just depressing right here. The circus gang are abducting children and stuffing them in these cages on wheels. Glad that didn't make it into the Happy Meal toys, but here's Batman to stop them. Naturally, the one monkey left behind lets Penguin know the bad news. Ah! Ew. Don't do that again. Still, he has a show to put on, in front of the penguins, which he's going to use to blow up all of Gotham with rockets strapped to their backs on a kamikaze run. Damn, not even the Joker can top this. <laughs> Alright, so throughout the movie we've seen a lot of penguins, in particular king penguins, African penguins, and emperor penguins. While they mostly used real penguins for the movie, the emperors were played by little people in costumes, while animatronics were used in large crowd shots, and CGI ones were used in overhead shots. These effects were also provided by Stan Winston and his studio and it all results in some very amusing and very cute little death penguins. Just look at them all, waddling into Gotham Plaza like that. They just have so much enthusiasm, it's infectious. You go, little guys. Anyhow, Batman races toward Penguin's lair in his Batsky boat and avoids some of their missiles. Once he gets the coordinates to where most of them are, he has Alfred jam the radio frequency and they turn around. I do like this scene as it shows that Alfred is more than just Bruce Wayne's butler, as he is a huge help to Batman in his adventures in crime fighting. Anyway, while the penguin's distracted, Max tries to have the monkey hand him the key to his cage. All the while, Batman is getting close and the circus gang begin to abandon their boss. Also, Penguin's duck boat is actually a car. Go figure. Jeez, Batman! You could have killed him with that maneuver! So now it's Batman versus the Penguin. You're just jealous because I'm a genuine freak and you have to wear a mask! But at least he doesn't kill people. Oh, 
Right, never mind. Batman seems to trick Penguin with a remote controlling the death penguins, which ticks them off enough to try and get it back. And while he does, the death penguins only launch their rockets into the air while a swarm of bats come out of the Batsky boat and make him stumble backward. As he falls, the rockets begin to destroy the zoo around them. Max is able to get the key from the monkey and freeze himself, but gets roped by Catwoman's whip. Though he grabs the gun off that one dead clown guy while underwater, he still has to deal with a very pissed off Catwoman. I don't know what you want, but I know I can get it for you. With a minimum of fuss. Okay, I think it's time we finally talk about the reason for Catwoman's look in this movie. The white stitching in the costume is meant to represent her damaged psyche after the trauma caused by her near-death experience that made her become Catwoman. The more the stitching unravels and the costume comes apart, the more unhinged and desperate she becomes. She feels that if she doesn't do this, Max will just get away with everything and there's no way she can live with that. Batman tries to convince her not to kill him, since he and her are the same and even shows her his real face. With his black eye makeup suddenly disappearing just before he rips his mask off, Oops. Despite Selina wanting to be with him, she knows she can't have a happy ending and claws his face. Max, slowly realizing who they are, shoots Bruce while Selina taunts him into shooting her since, having died so many times, she has six lives left. One way to find out. Damn! Well, she still seems okay. Dude, stop! Can't you see the poor girl's had enough? Oh, and remember that taser she picked up earlier? Over the kiss, Santa Claus. Well, that was a rather shocking development. Really? Nothing? Okay. Oh, and Penguin's still alive, and he's drooling green blood, it seems. Shows how much of a monster he really is. Well, at least he looks better than what happened to Shrek. But despite his efforts, he cannot kill Batman. Hey, a cool drink of ice water. Man, everyone Batman fights in these movies seems to die painfully. But this one is just sad. But is it really, though? I mean, he wanted to murder children, was a disgusting pervert in a lot of places, and even killed that cat when he was a baby. However, I think a lot of this could have been avoided if his parents weren't so awful by abandoning him without trying to raise him into being a better person. The only ones who cared for him were the penguins. And speaking of... appropriate. In a sense, the penguin was born in the sewers, and so it is only fitting that he dies there as well. Afterwards, Alfred drives Bruce through the city while he thinks of everything that's happened, but then he spots a shadow of Catwoman in an alleyway, only to find her cat. And I guess since he doesn't have Ace the Bad Hound in this universe, Miss Kitty will be... Uh, hey Alfred, I found a bat cat, sir. I'm afraid that's not very clever. Oh man. Well, come what may. Merry Christmas, Mr. Way. Merry Christmas, Alfred. Goodwill toward men and women. And just so that this isn't a completely bitter ending. Returns is definitely an interesting movie, though I can see why it garnered the kind of reaction it got back in 1992. While many elements would fall in line with the first movie, they really amp up the violence in order to match Burton's style of directing. The duality of man and beast that's often found in his films is really brought out with how disgusting they make the penguin and what he does. It really feels like Burton was pushing for an R rating given the way people die or are brutalized. And while that could have worked, it wasn't what the executives wanted and it caused public outcry after release. Seriously, I wasn't kidding about the recalled Happy Meal toys since the McDonald's didn't want to associate this kind of movie with kids' toys. And parents were especially appalled with what was going on here. Heck, even the toys released by Kenner had a more comic book accurate version of the Penguin, rather than the one we actually got in the movie. Thankfully, it didn't affect the overall quality of Batman the Animated Series, 
which premiered months after this movie came out, as you can believe that it affected the next two movies. Speaking of, the Penguin's design in the show was originally going to be more comic accurate, but as a way to promote Batman Returns, it was changed to better resemble the movie's iteration. Sorry about the intrusion, sir, but at least you've been ransacked by a man of impeccable taste. However, personality-wise, he was more of a gentleman criminal, like in the comics, with his voice being provided by Paul Williams. And the movie's influence didn't end there either, as Burton's Penguin design would also influence the iteration seen in the 2004 animated series, The Batman, the Arkham video game series, and even the comic books to an extent. Hell, Danny DeVito himself even wrote a Penguin story for the Batman comics in 2021, where he dates Catwoman, and cures COVID? No joke, that apparently happened, and I don't know how to feel about it. Well, I do know how I feel about this movie. Despite a lot of moments intended to be shocking or appalling, along with a few plot holes like the Batmobile blueprints, there is still a continuation of Batman's character as he tries to relate to another masked vigilante who was wronged by high society. He also continues to be witty with his gadgets, his deduction skills, and his ability to fight crime. It's still Batman, just a bit darker. Catwoman's character is enjoyable as well. A bit awkward in some parts, though befitting to her cat motif. Penguin I can see being an example of what happens when high society abandons one for being different, and it can warp and corrupt them over time. Plus, all of them give wonderful performances all around. Sadly, even with all this and the beautiful cinematography, as a result of the McDonald's controversy and the public's overall reaction to the movie itself, Burton would not get to direct any more Batman films. Even though he was excited to do so and had his own plans for a third one involving the Riddler, Warner Brothers, for their future films, would replace Burton as director in order to better market Batman for family-friendly audiences, replacing him with Joel Schumacher, and bumping Burton down to an executive producer credit for Batman Forever in 1995 and then phasing him out completely for Batman and Robin in 1997. And we all know how the latter turned out. I killed the dinosaurs. That is aid. Maybe one day I'll cover the other films in this particular set. For now, I'll just say that this movie is at least worth a watch if you're going through the old line of Batman films. Is it dark? Yes. Violent? Yes. But it sure is entertaining. Next time, I'll have one more Patreon review to cover before we truly end the season. Until then, where'd you get that? <coughs> Who's it from? Dear Media Hunter and Loki, thanks for the kind words. Hope you two have a perfect Christmas together. Normally, I don't write to multiverse folks, but I was told by an affiliate to keep track of you guys. By the way, if you run into Big Jack Films, tell him that Bat and I are ready for the call. Happy Holidays from Gotham. P.S. Here's hoping we meet sometime, Loki. You big adorable kitty, you. She likes you. <laughs> Surprised they got the call from Jack, too. This might be bigger than expected. Anyway, let's see what she got us. The 2004 Catwoman movie? Ah, oh, crap! All six issues of the Batman 89 comic series? Well, I guess Burton's Catwoman isn't so bad after all. Merry Christmas, Miss Kyle. And a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year to all of you as well. I'm the Media Hunter, media is my prey, and reviewing them my way.